Hello and welcome to Underspace. Before we get further into this video, I want to thank Trainwith for providing me with an early copy of the build. Not seriously, I didn't even ask for the thing, I just went on Discord one day and was like, here's a code. In addition to this, some disclaimers, it's a pre-release build and I stress that more than people watch other games because um, the game gets updated every day. Flipping, I report a bug at like 9pm and then at 2am a patch comes out fixing it. That's how fast things are getting fixed. Um, and secondly, this video is coming out early. The game is coming out on April 10th. I did get Train Wizards explicit approval to post this, even though I am not technically under embargo. Alright, let's not waste any time and get straight into it. First of all, let's talk about the graphics. Um, they're hardly next gen. Um, but it does make up for that in being, for being stylized. The game is very, it looks very nice, it's very vibrant. Adds a lot of personality to the game because every star system, this is very underrated as base games. I think they should do it a lot more, but every star system has a unique skybox. And it's just so fun just going from system to system and seeing these different environments in the background. It's a really nice underrated detail. Now let's talk about the gameplay. Firstly, the game plays pretty much exactly like Freelancer. At least on a 30 second scale. Just in terms of how you navigate the world how you engage in dogfights, how you customise your ship, that sort of thing. Um, there are also lots of unique spins on the gameplay too that makes it stand out. Um, you have like different objectives that are really quite interesting and is most of the game well, there is a lot of going here and shoot the thing, but there are a lot of unique takes on how you go about doing that. Um, the biggest problem I have with the general gameplay loop is that um, the reticle may not always be accurate. However, I have find, found myself adjusting to this and being able to shoot fairly accurately without looking strictly at the reticle. So it's far from impossible to play without that accuracy. The, as for customization, you can change the colour of your ship, you can you can change the colour of your thrusters, you can modify those sorts of different things. You can put different weapons, there's a, cl a level system, so certain weapons can only go so high on a level of ship. There are three tiers of ship, ten levels of equipment, fairly standard stuff. However, one thing I will say is that, um, unlike Freelancer, not every ship has a unique model, and that kind of takes away from it a bit. There's also a skill tree as well, um, which is interesting. Every time you level up, you get so many points, and you can invest these points in these little stat boosts. This may be a problem in multiplayer PvP, but I have not actually messed around with it. It's probably not even going to make it to launch. Speaking of not making it to launch, there are some missing features. Like, um, the multiplayer is in the current build, but Trainwiz is talking about taking it out because it's very bare, bare bones and very broken at the moment. And um, he's too focused on patching up bugs on the single player game, on the single player experience. Um, secondly, um, this may be addressed by the time a game comes out, I don't know. There's still new stuff coming to the game, new content. Um, but some interiors of the stations are missing. Um, particularly some of the unique stations. Um, that aren't like all the others. Um, one thing I know for a fact won't make it to launch because Trainwiz told me 
um, well, make it to early access, it will be there for its official launch, is voice acting. That's not in there yet. There are AI voices and they do a decent job at making the world around you feel alive. Um, however, most of the campaign is not voiced by um, by anything, not even AI, um, except for random occasional voice lines for some reason. Um, but the AI does do enough to make the world feel lively because you can hear them constantly chatting and talking and interacting with each other. Um, they say things while you're dogfighting them. Um, the space stations contact convoys, they talk to each other and all that sort of thing. Small little details that make the world feel alive essentially. Now for the big thing, the grand scale of the game. Um, this is not going to be comprehensive because I have barely touched the tip of the iceberg. Trainwith has given us a Excel spreadsheet to help us record bugs and it contains everything that could appear in the game in the open world. So, and it's big. It is big. Especially the quests. There are a lot of quests. So, let's start with what the game focuses a lot of its marketing on. Storm chasing. So, throughout the galaxy, you'll have these underspatial storms. These storms will have all sorts of knock-on effects on the systems that it affects. Um, it allow it makes enemies stronger. It increases the prices of cargo, so it's more expensive to buy. But it's also more, you get more from selling it as well, so it works both ways. Um, and enemies are stronger, I've already said that, I realise. So, to deal with the storm, you actually have to attack an underspatial rift that will appear in the star system's nebula. Once you enter the nebula, the rift will become visible on your scanner. So you could just click on it on that bottom left box and then you know where it is and you could just go to it. Now, these rifts come in different categories. The more di Dangerous, the higher the category. I think there's up to five, I think. Um, and all sorts come out of that rift. Ghosts, um, possessed warships, leviathan creatures, and trains, for some reason. I... I guess his username checks out with train with. It's worth noting that whatever comes out of these storms is randomised. And I've probably not experienced anywhere near all of these. Next is the crests. Now, they come in a few for variety. They essentially act as like your Bethesda style side little mini campaigns type thing. Um, you can start and stop them whenever you want, and you can find them. Some of them are found on stations. It's actually a unique marker when you select the station, so you can see if a quest is available on that station. Sometimes you can also just find them in the open world, like say you're just flying through space, suddenly you might get a distress cop, that sort of thing. And then that will lead you down a quest mission. And then there's the third type of quest. Where it's flipping hidden by like a zombie style easter egg quest. Um, there's one jump gate that is that you in order to access you have to figure out the access code 
and that's got to do with the order of the planets in the star system. It would take about two brain cells to solve, but um, I'm no good at math, but that's about three more than I have. The next thing to talk about is the main campaign. Now this I have played through fully, this is spoiler free, so I'm not going to talk about the story. I will say, um, the story is sort of predictable. Um, there were some twists that I didn't see coming, but a lot of them I did see coming and I saw them from quite a ways away. Like to the point where I put in Discord jokingly, it's like, oh I bet this, this and this is about to happen. And then sure enough, this, this and this did happen. Um, it also doesn't help that the campaign was fairly stop and start for me due to running into soft lock issues. Um, in fairness, Train Race was quick to resolve them so I could get back to playing through the campaign. But with Bug Fixing being like a game of whack a mole, I can't. I've never went back to the start because there's a lot to play. I've never went back to the beginning of the campaign and played through a second time. Um, interestingly enough, all of the promotional footage, none of it is campaign footage. So, um, yeah, if you think the trailers are showing you a lot of what to expect from the main campaign, yeah, that expectation is about to be put on its head. Um, and then, throughout the open world, there's also just, like, world bosses. Bosses are just sort of spawn naturally, they just sort of chill until you show up and try and kill them. That's fine, I'm sure um, a lot of these things that you have to go out and find, which also is the case of quests. Um, hopefully when the game comes out someone will put together like an exhaustive list of where you can go to find these things. And, and then lastly are the missions. Probably the simplest part of the game. It's basically just to grind out cash. There are different types of missions. There are missions where you have to go attack things, you have to go kill things. There are more long form missions where you have to kill so many fires just while you're out and about. Um, there's also like trade missions where you have to go and take some cargo to another station or um, even some missions where they ask you to resupply the base with a certain item, certain resource. So you have to go out, collect that resource and then bring it back. So there's a decent amount of variety. There's also like faction specific missions. So if you take missions from say pirates, they'll ask you to smuggle stuff about without being detected and all that sort of thing. Now, as for the world building of the game, I, I'm also going to talk about that because it is incredible. Normally I don't care about this sort of thing, but it just fascinates me. Every star system you go to, there's some sort of story, like a remnant of an empire before you, or something like that. And the individual species in the game are also very unique. No more of those flippant Star Trek funny forehead things. The species are all unique. For example, um, the most grounded species are the Voldwin. They are pretty human, but um, I think that's important for the sake of grounding the thing. Well, I say grounded, it's not very grounded, but creating a sense of, like, a relatable environment. Like, these are individuals that look familiar in that sense. Um, then you have the Ijuni. These very interesting British lobsters. They are a blast to be around. They've got some flipping funny dialogue. Um, then there's Bolden. I don't know how to describe the Bolden. Looks like a flipping gonk droid that has found its way to ascension. Then there's the aft. Very angry crystal people. It doesn't get much less creative than that. Then there's the Veils, who are um, who were, were in an environment so tough 
that they ended up evolving as essentially mechs. So that's interesting. Then you have Macrovi, also very interesting, because they are actually sapient microorganisms that built a, a, like, a mech suit, essentially, that allows them to interact with the larger world. Then, lastly, the ooze. Interesting that um, the the spelling U-S has already has two meanings and Swainwiz decided to add a third meaning while also having it been pronounced completely differently. Um, but the U's are fascinating. They are like a, sa a sapient fungi that reproduce by infecting and then possessing de dead bodies. But instead of being like typical brain dead zombies, they try to be an actual function member of society. And because of the way they inherently like come to be, essentially being walking dead, um, there's a lot of interesting things about discrimination and whatnot. Now, one last thing I want to talk about is the soundtrack. This, normally it's like, yeah, it does a job, but this one, this is kind of like Halo or Star Wars, where you think about the music after, when you're not even playing the game. It is really good. You might consider, like, checking, listening to the music outside of the game. It's a really good soundtrack. So, in conclusion, there are elements that will be missing from day one pre-alpha, but at the same time, there is a lot of things to do. There are a lot of places to explore, a lot of missions to do, and there are a lot of options presented to the player. I would personally recommend it, however, if you're interested in like being fully immersed in like the main campaign and the quests and whatnot, I would maybe recommend waiting until voice acting is added because that could also take away from the experience of the main campaign. That is probably a, the biggest issue I have is that that isn't there for day one. But that's my opinion on Underspace. The game comes out on April 10th. I'll see you guys then.